reasons to remember Justice Rajinder Sachar. The most important being that today is his birthday. Today, as we gather to launch his autobiography that he had begun writing many years ago, we're also here to pay tribute to him. When he passed away two years ago, the book comprised handwritten notes and some recorded interviews that were transcribed by his trusted secretary, Niranjan Kaushik, and thereafter by my friend, independent journalist and writer, Chitra Padmanabhan, who spent many months on the request of the family to edit and produce the final manuscript, which has been now published by Rupa Publications. Just as such a war, many a splendored hat. As he juggled his many roles, he was a former Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. He was also a civil rights activist, proud of his socialist credentials, and a man whose instinct it was to take on the establishment. It is perhaps an irony that an instinctively anti-establishment man like the late Rajinder Sachar acquired nationwide fame for producing a report as chairperson of a government appointed committee. The delectable anecdotes and inspiring stories about his fight for justice pale in comparison to the debate that was triggered because of this report he prepared as chairperson of the Prime Minister's high level committee on the social, economic and educational status of the Muslim community in India. Published in 2006, it became known as the Sachar Committee Report. It is a statistical and sociological marvel praised by all for quantifying the socioeconomic status of the Muslim community and its rich diversity. Overnight, the report turned Justice Sachar into a hero among educated Muslims, surprised as they were with the candor with which the report had described their experiences. So here we are today with the entire Satcher family who together with the Indian Society of International Law represented by the Secretary General M.K. Rao and Professor Manoj Sinha, the Director of the Indian Law Institute are hosting this event uh, by sharing some parts of Justice Satcher's life journey through his autobiography. And it is certainly no wonder that a galaxy of eminent dignitaries is in attendance. I'd like to now introduce and welcome our eminent panelists and thank them for taking time from their busy schedules to grace this occasion. We are delighted to have with us the retired Honorable Justice Madan B. Lokur, former judge of the Supreme Court of India and currently the judge of the Supreme Court of Fiji, is the only Indian to be appointed to the highest court of another country. Senior advocate and former minister, Kapil Sibyl, senior advocate and former Attorney General of India, Mukul Rohatki, socialist, uh, social activist and founder of the Narmada Bachao Andolan, founder and national convener of the National Alliance of People's Movement, and presently a member of the core committee of the ongoing farmers agitation, Medha Patkar. The discussion that will follow the launch of In Pursuit of Justice will be moderated by award-winning senior journalist, author, and consulting editor, and lead news anchor of India Today Group, Rajdeep Sardesai. Before we dive deeper into the event, let me just share a few housekeeping notes that I request you all to please follow strictly to enable a smooth event. Please ensure that your mics are muted as you join us to ensure that the speakers are not disturbed as they're speaking. All through the event, our program team will be monitoring both the chat box and the questions uh, as much as we want this to be as close and interactive to a live event as possible. We are forced to request you to please share your comments and questions, if any, in the chat box only. You're welcome to engage with our teams on Twitter and on Facebook. Please do tweet as we progress in the evening. Use the hashtag, hashtag in pursuit of justice to start or join our conversations. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We now begin our event and invite a very special person to do us the honors, the grandson of Justice Rajinder Sachar, 28-year-old Sunil Sachar, who's an author, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker. Sunil is the founding partner of Huddle, a sector agnostic uh, incubator in Gurgaon, providing a 360 degree support to multiple startups. 
a best-selling author in the country and one of the few Indian writers to be published in all forms of literature. He has over 120 poems, 25 short stories, scripts, and a novel to his name. Much like his grandfather, Sunil is a sports person by heart with a similar mission to create a positive change through his passions one day at a time. May I invite Sunil to open the forum with his thoughts. Sunil. Whatever you do, always stay humble. This sentence in itself defines justice, Rajinder Sachar, my dada. I remember sitting with him uh, one evening and like most days, the conversation went from one sport to the other and him, then him asking me about what's happening in school and then directing the conversation into a lot of guidance that all family members use to this day and for many more to come. It was on this very day, I remember, Dada spoke to me and said, whatever you do, always stay humble. I'll be honest, in that moment, I didn't know what humility meant, neither as a word nor an action. But I grew up observing it in everything he did, that which he stood for and loved contributing his time towards. Today, this evening is a very special and momentous one. We're celebrating someone whose life, like, paved everyone else's like an architect, a path he ensured through honesty and joy in each moment. It's his birthday and the book launch of the autobiography of a friend to all, a sounding board for many more, and a gentleman who lives on. It's an honor to have an extremely pro prolific set of minds here today to celebrate this book, to celebrate much more than this book. Because if there's one thing Dada loved, it was a rich and healthy discussion. I often got to witness Dada and my brother debate on several points, from covering the latest happenings in the world or even fictional court matters. I remember my brother was around 12 years old, but he stood his point and spoke to Dada about several points almost as though they were in court. And subtly in his ever so magical manners, Dada mentored my brother into becoming the great and confident lawyer he is today. I know for sure that my fiance Ria and Dada, if they would have met in person, they too would have had countless conversations and bonded over. There were subtle ways he made an impact in people's lives, family, friends, and strangers who remember him for what they are doing and what they might do. Similarly, his love for desserts, oh, his love for desserts. I think the passion came and they, they, it spurred from his love into the, the grandchild, we all know he loved so much so as a best friend, and that's my sister. That passion got her, which I firmly believe, into becoming an absolutely phenomenal patissier, an absolutely phenomenally trained chef. And here's the coincidence. Today, while I am an uncle to Rohan and uh, my sister's, gra uh, my, my daughter's great-granddaughter, Arya, and you know, uh, my niece, I see her light eyes light up very similarly in how his would when we would say the word dessert or cake. There are subtle ways people live on and I get to witness it every day. So on a day we celebrate the launch of a book I hold as the most important book to my life. I'd like to share with you, it was while this was being written, Dada would ask us, how do I write this? What should I write? And that's what I found funny. The man, the gentleman, and the friend who guided me into writing books that I never thought I had the capability of doing, somehow made it a part of everyone else's life so that they can be a part of his biggest moments. Moments that he knew were coming for our, all of us to celebrate. So as his grandson, I want to cover just two, three very quick points that will make you know Dada as the gentleman and the friend and the colleague we've all known him as. So as we all know, knew, he was a sports person at all times, an ace tennis player. It didn't matter whether he was on or off court, he played each stroke of life like it was a match. However competitive, he made sure it was friendly. It was during his love for tennis that I got to realize that everyone in this house has got to love tennis. Everyone was either a Federer fan or a Nadal fan, but tennis had to be an area where it was a good excuse for all of us to bond. So much so that even when at the age of 85, he would walk onto court when my brother and I were trying to use power and speed to play tennis, he'd take our racket and slice the ball 
making us realize that much so in life as on court, it's not speed and power to win. It took technique and patience. And that's another way he made us realize that lessons can be subtly learned. So much so that his competitiveness made us competitive as siblings uh, to one another. Uh, safe to say my brother and I weren't the highest scorers in, uh, in grades. And he, he realized that and made us aggregate our marks together, tally them up so that we could compete with, my, with our sister. I wouldn't say we succeeded, but it was in these subtle ways he made us realize that in order to call a fault, you've got to be able to celebrate that as well. So much like he did in life, Dada didn't only test the limits, but ensured that we strive for better. So lastly, I believe that what will stay with me, and I hope stays with all of us today, is that he continued to learn every day. He read for countless number of hours, learned a lot about his family each day by ensuring he knew about everything we did. And more importantly, it was his aura and calmness that ensured that while we were being guided by a mentor, he remained the best, best friend we could speak to in pursuit of justice. A book with the most apt title, it has a ring of continuity, doesn't it? An everlasting connotation, much like Justice Rajendra Sachar, my dada. Continuity, everlastingness, much beyond yourself. Leadership, not for oneself, but for others. And with that, I'd like to welcome you all here today on what is a proud book launch, a birthday to celebrate, and a life that keeps living on. To conclude, I'll end this speech by searching into my pocket, realizing that if I were to go put my hand in his pocket, I'll be able to celebrate with dessert something that he did because each day was a celebration. So for all of you here today, I thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this journey. And may we all be in pursuit of justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanil. Kuch meetha ho jai, as they say. Uh, fabulous words that you've uh, used to describe uh, your relationship with your grandfather. We wish you the best in your ventures. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Sachar has two more grandchildren, Shreya Sachar and Akshay Bhandari. I'd like to invite Shreya and Akshay to share with us some of their fond memories of their uh, uh, very, very dear grandfather. And um, what we'll do is we'll start by just describing Shreya to you first. Um, Sanil has made my task a little more easier. Uh, she is the elder sister of uh, Sanil. Uh, she's an MBA from Liverpool University, who went on to train as a patisserie chef from the reputed Le Cordon Bleu London Culinary School. She worked as a pastry chef at the Oberoi Hotel before setting up her own gourmet confectionery brand called Scuti by Shreya uh, that offers gourmet deserts, chocolates and healthy alternatives. So it's no surprise that uh, Grandfather Sacha was Shreya's very first customer and critic and thrilled to bits when Shreya founded Skuti by Shreya. Uh, Shreya now resides in Gurgaon with her husband Rohan that you can see on the screen, who is the director of uh, design at Urban Company. And they have a 14 month old daughter called Arya. Uh, I, I know that she's there in the screen, but uh, not visible there. Well, we moved the, there's Arya for us. Uh, so Shreya, could you please share your video with us? Today is an extremely emotional day for us as a family. We are all so glad that Dada's autobiography has finally made its way to all of you. I remember having many a discussion along with my brothers coaxing Dada to pen down his thoughts and life stories. And he would always say, Maine kya kya hai? what have I done? I guess that's how simple, how humble and selfless he really was. Today also happens to be his birthday. And birthdays were a reason for all of us to get together as a family and celebrate. We'd pick our favorite cuisine, restaurant of our choice, dress up and all of us would step out. Despite his busy traveling schedule, Dada made it a point to be there for each of our birthdays. Mine happened to fall on the same day as Dada Dadi's anniversary, so we always got two cakes. I was the closest to Dada. I could discuss more with him than I've ever discussed with my parents, whether it was about boys, about an issue that was probably irking me, or just life in general. 
he was also a very reasonable man i remember when my parents brother and i moved to a new home in gurgaon he knew that it wouldn't be possible for the two of us to talk every day so we picked wednesday as our day to catch up one time i got really busy with work and i forgot to call him and to teach me a lesson he stayed up longer than his usual time that we had agreed upon and mind you that was 2 am because he would be so busy reading and i found out the next day from my aunt and i felt so guilty that i never forgot after that I was also very fortunate to have both my grandfathers present on my wedding to bless my husband Rohan and me. I remember Dada had gotten a little weak by that time, but he still made it a point to get up and shake a leg with Rohan and me on our reception day. I really wish he were here today to see my baby girl Arya. She's 14 months old now and I can only imagine how crazy they would be about each other. She's definitely got his sweet tooth and I can't wait for her to grow up till I share stories of this great human being who was my best friend, my first love, my confidant. I love you, Dada. Thank you, Shreya. The middle grandchild, Akshay Bhandari, is a practicing lawyer. who followed in the footsteps of his grandfather to join the legal profession and spent a considerable amount of time uh, with him to learn train and grasp the intricacies of the profession uh, from the grand old man himself let's hear akshay now speak about his grandfather in this video Okay, we're just going to get the video up. You can see Akshay on the screen. I go yeah. to speak about my grandfather. Been given two and a half minutes, and frankly, it's going to be very difficult, considering that my memories with him are spanning about thirty years, and the influence that he's had on my life is immeasurable. But what I do recall of and is. Uh, Firstly, the way he trained me, me to no matter one day court before him, and uh, the way he would grill me till date, I've never had anyone grill me like that. Uh, for every point I said, he would ask me about thirty odd questions and uh, completely grill me. and to an extent that uh, my confidence would be shattered and i one one time i specifically remember that he was going on questioning me and uh, finally about after 10 minutes of answering his questions he said okay fine proceed and i completely forgot what i was arguing because i'd gone into so much detail what he was saying so then he told me that see this can also happen in court so you must have a way of rescuing yourself from such a situation So please take a pen. Always have a pen in your hand and write down what you were arguing when you've gone into that debate, and then look at your paper again and start from where you had left off. That's one way of ensuring you don't get off track, and that's something I follow till date. In court, each time there's a we're going into details of some point, I quickly make a note of where we're leaving off. Also, uh, there was it's funny also in a certain way because he would prepare a note for all my files in the morning. He would take my files from my clerk and prepare a note in the car. When I would read the files, I would see his note. So I would say, say this point, say that point, and stop. And uh, the judge would ask you this question, and then say this and end your matter. And invariably, the judge would ask me that question, and the matter would go exactly the way he had predicted. Now, the only exception to this is that if there was a grand slam on and he was watching tennis. then he would not take out time to train me or prepare a note the tennis would have uh, precedence over me but uh, apart from that i wish him a very happy birthday and i'm sure he's watching over all of us 
Thank you so much, uh, Shreya and Akshay and Sanal for sharing um, those emotional and intimate anecdotes uh, of your relationship with your grandfather and his influence on your lives. Ladies and gentlemen, Rupa Publishers has grown today to be the country's oldest and as well as uh, the largest independent publishing house. It has redefined the rules of Indian publishing, finding and promoting the most exciting talent in both fiction and nonfiction, ranging from biographies to history and philosophy to sports, self-help books and business. We have a video message from the managing director of Rupa Publications, the publisher of this particular volume, Mr. Kapish Mehra. Hi, everybody. Uh, a very good evening to the members of the Justice Sachar family, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. For us at Rupa, it is a matter of privilege to have the opportunity to publish Just Justice Sachar's autobiography in pursuit of justice. It is not every day that one comes across a profile and a person like Justice Sachar. His story, I must say, is incredible, for he has been a lone voice not once but on many occasions and has continued to strive to speak his mind, be heard and also reinforcing his views on people whom he believes had a role to play in the decision-making process. And doing that for more than half a century is not an easy task and Justice Sachar uh, from this book, it seems stuck to it wholeheartedly. Uh, it is incredible to read about this person because not only was he somebody who had a, you know, a defining uh, opinion on a variety of subjects, but he was also a lovely family man, great friends, respected widely, and friendships kept across uh, decades, even with friends with whom he had a difference of opinion. That shows the kind of person he was, and definitely it is a matter of pride for any publisher, and now especially us, to have the opportunity to publish his life's journey. I must uh, admit that I was deeply touched by Sanjeev's uh, interpretation of his father, where he calls him uh, his ultimate hero, and stresses on the various aspects that of life that Justice Sachar taught him. Um, it is really something uh, that one can relate to and be inspired from because it isn't every day that you come across uh, journeys like this and people like this. Uh, so I wish the very best to the family um, on the occasion of the release of this book uh, and I'm sure that uh, somewhere from above Justice Sachar will be smiling at all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Kapish. Uh, uh, it's now time ladies and gentlemen to reveal the autobiography of Justice Sachar and I request all our panel members, Honorable Justice uh, Lokur, Kapil Sibbal, Mukul Rohatki, Medha Patkarji, Rajdeep, family members of Justice Sachar, his daughter Madhvi, daughter-in-law Sita, uh, and son Sanjeev, M.K. Rao from the Indian Society of International Law and Professor Manoj Sinha of the Indian Law Institute to please hold up uh, your copies of the book to the cameras as we virtually launch the autobiography, In Pursuit of Justice, an autobiography, the story of a great jurist who was an even greater human being, Justice Sacher, a socialist, an egalitarian, a defender of civil liberties, a deeply engaged citizen of India, and above all, a humanist, a man who believed in standing for the last man in the line. He was armed with a moral compass that never wavered. Aptly, his autobiography titled, In Pursuit of Justice. For those of you who haven't got a copy as yet, log on and order one for yourself. Today, it is available on Amazon, on Flipkart and Snapdeal, as well as in all leading bookstores. Thank you all. I'd like to now invite the award-winning hardcore political journalist, Rajdeep Sardesai, who began his career in print journalism, moving to television news anchoring while continuing to write columns in well-known publications uh, to moderate this panel discussion on personal freedom and the judiciary. Uh, Rajdeep, as you know, has been dominating India's television news media for decades now, uh, with powerful stints at NDTV, IBN, 18 Network, and currently at the India Today Group. Uh, I'd like to now invite him to moderate the panel discussion on the topic, personal freedom and the judiciary, and also to introduce the panelists to us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder that you need to keep posting your questions in the Q&A box. And towards the end, depending on time, Rajdeep will take, a, take up a few of them uh, for the panel to address. Rajdeep, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rini, for uh, that very kind and generous introduction and for the wonderful way you've set the platform for what is an important book by one of the most distinguished jurists that this country has seen in pursuit of justice an autobiography of Justice Rajinder Satchar. And it is a great honor and I thank uh, Sanjeev and the family for inviting me to moderate this book of someone who remains an iconic figure over the last half century. Personal freedom and judiciary is perhaps something which was very close to Justice Satchar's heart. You can see it when you read the book, the number of anecdotes that he has where he remained a staunch defender above all else of individual freedoms. We have a very distinguished panel of speakers with us, Justice Retired Madan Lokur, Kapil Sibal, Mukul Rothki, and Medha Patkar, none of whom really need an introduction. Their work uh, precedes them both in the judiciary, in the case of my first three guests, and in the case of Medha in her work that she's done in defending individual liberties and human rights. So thank you all very much for joining me. I'm going to start with a proposition and I'm going to throw at my four guests and ask them to speak for a couple of minutes each on this. What if I said that till a few years ago, the Supreme Court of India gave considerable importance and significance to social justice, personal freedom, human rights, and the dignity of the individual. But in the last few years, some of these thoughts have been pushed on the back burner. Would I be right in saying that? Or am I exaggerating this? Why don't I start with uh, Justice Lokur, since it's usually the turn of the judge uh, on our panel to, in a way, kick off this debate on personal freedom and judiciary. So uh, if Justice Lokur, you're with us, would you like to start? Am I right yeah, with this proposition of mine? Yeah, thank you, uh, Rajdeep. Yes, uh, you are right, uh, as always. Uh, you know, I, I remember uh, maybe about uh, six or seven years ago when the social justice bench uh, was inaugurated in the Supreme Court. Uh, the first case that we had to deal with uh, was uh, Medha Patkar's case about the rehabilitation of uh, the Austies. Um, and since then, you know, for some time, uh, we had to deal with a very large number of uh, cases on a variety of uh, issues. But uh, unfortunately, you know, in the last uh, two years or so, uh, I think the idea of uh, social justice has really gone on the back burner. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's this year because of the pandemic that certain situations uh, had arisen uh, where I think the Supreme Court should have been far, far more proactive uh, than it ever was. Uh, you know, to look after the interests of uh, a large number of people, migrants, for example, persons who had been thrown out of their jobs, a variety of uh, uh, people from all walks of life. Um, but I think the Supreme Court, um, you know, could have definitely done much better than what it did um, uh, this year. So really, I would, I would agree with you that uh, over the last uh, couple of years, the idea of uh, social justice has uh, gone on the back burner. Uh, it's unfortunate, um, but yeah, I, th I suppose we have to live with it. Well, you've in a sense set the cat yeah. among the pigeons when a, when a former judge virtually sort of admits that the Supreme Court has perhaps failed its, uh, its remit or its mandate in a way. Why don't I get, since I've heard from the bench, Let's hear from the bar. Why don't you start, Mukul Rodhi, former Attorney General? Do you, all, do you also believe that there has been a retreat on concepts of human rights, personal freedom, social justice, as uh, is being suggested by Justice Loku? I would tend to agree with Justice Loku that the prime place which was given in the Constitution and the Supreme Court is the conscience keeper of the nation to cases of infraction of liberty and the like have been kind of pushed back 
and what comes to mind are cases of habeas corpus and other cases which are now taking anywhere between 6 months to a year to decide they were always treated with utmost priority a habeas corpus case was taken up immediately and decided within 2 weeks but that is not so other things seem to have taken over but i must add a word of caution and that is this that it's it's very well to to blame somebody but i think the supreme court has also taken o- taken on too much mm-hmm. the role of a traditional court has long been lost i mean lost for the last maybe 40 50 years so if you take on too much sometimes the priorities differ and once the priorities differ these kind of inconsistencies do come in but yes the supreme court should shrug off this uh, in action on these kind of cases and take them take them up vigorously that's what i would say interesting that that a former attorney general and a judge are in a sense giving us headlineable points when they seem to suggest and an interesting observation that just uh, that mr rohit makes there when you seem to suggest that the supreme court is taking on too much for itself and thereby perhaps that's one of the reasons why these notions of personal liberty human rights uh, and the dignity of the individual get lost out kapil sibal former union minister and also senior lawyer why don't you take that up do you believe that uh, has this happened only in the last couple of years or has there been a steady erosion over a considerable period of time for some of the reason that uh, mr rohit just pointed out the court simply having to take up far too much including administrative issues at times which may not necessarily be the remit of a court i think that um, i think both uh, justice lokur and 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 my friend rohit are absolutely right uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, the supreme court has lost its way uh, not just two years ago but i think several years ago and uh, what's happening in the supreme court today is that issues that are highly political um, are taken up uh issues that deal with liberty are brushed under the carpet um mukul rightly mentioned about habeas corpus um there were people in kashmir who were detained for over a year not not pursuant to any preventive detention order but pursuant to breach of peace under section 144 of the code of criminal procedure which can last only for a certain number of months and that was renewed from time to time supreme court took, took no notice of it communications communications allowing for communications between people which is at the heart of liberty they would not deal with it um migrant labor as as justice loker mentioned uh, one of their law officers went to court and said there are no people walking on the street on the highways i mean this was what was said in the supreme court while on the on the social media platforms and on some television channels thousands of people were walking home because they had no way to reach home people who were not being supplied with food which was incumbent of the government under the national disaster management act which is and and had to be done through the national management disaster authority which was to be headed by the prime minister after the pandemic happened businesses lost out small entrepreneurs lost out the medium and small scale sector lost out you had to reach out to them court had to reach out to them and ask ask the supreme court what they were doing matters have been lingering on for months so i think yes i think i think they have been too too soft on the supreme court actually the supreme court has lost its way what we see is corporate matters most important corporate matters coming up in court and taking days on end when the real problems of the people are not being addressed many matters that had to be taken up have not been taken up since whether it was the electoral bonds issue or it's the other major issues the uh, the CAA issue not it's not on the roster of the court at all so what are we talking about I'll come back to all three of you in a moment, but I want to turn to you, Meeda Patkar, because you are, in a sense, uh, not part of the judiciary, 
but you are someone who's been deeply involved in fighting for human rights over decades now and you actually knew justice sachar particularly in his pucl days give us a sense of the man when we talk today of the pursuit of justice and i hear two distinguished lawyers and a distinguished former judge suggesting that the supreme court has lost its way how did you find in justice sachar somewhere a uh, uh, a comrade in arms almost who was more than willing to take that extra step in pursuit of concepts of personal liberty and individual freedoms thanks radhi bhai <clears throat> justice sachar was a great mentor and a very close friend philosopher and guide for all of us who believe very strongly and feel committed to democratic socialism his whole legal regime that he resorted to is no more existing before us today when the 44 labor legislations are out and three anti farmer legislations are in imposed during lockdown through undemocratic process we have to fight the battles outside the court and not just inside and justice sachar was very clear about this whenever he talk about the personal freedom and civil liberties he always respected mass movements as people's politics and people's court in which we push our view points our perspectives our paradigms our alternatives and sought justice justice sachar was not only for legal justice he was for human justice and he was the one whether he looked at the narmada valley situation or the laborers uh, you know uh, atrocities faced by scheduled castes and scheduled tribes he always said that without a mass movement outside the parliament and outside judiciary that is without just holding on to one and all pillars of democracy you will really push the democratic freedom and rights and win the battles and that's why we held him with kuldeep nayar and others as close to us today we see and we have experienced during our readings before the judiciary at various levels that not only that they are taking extra burden on their shoulder i feel exactly the opposite that they are not taking any burden on following the constitutional framework the rights women's rights are human rights laborers rights are human rights adivasi rights are human rights but none of those really form the framework when they have also personal freedom of conscience no doubt but they also have a responsibility to make us feel that when we hold this small little leather bound book in our hands we are holding the very destiny of the nation and especially the oppressed and depressed classes and yet we know that the judiciary is not looking into what justice sachar would have and he was following in every aspect of life right to life and livelihood electoral reforms with the nota and the very serious alternatives that he brought in when the valueless electoral politics really gave us no hope and no confidence in bringing in the basic transformation as far as narmada valley is concerned whenever we pleaded even before the progressive judges we always fell short of convincing them about the huge atrocity and enormous destruction that was and that has brought by this project but justice sachar didn't just sit on the sat on the first uh, you know row in the court but stood mm-hmm. for us every time and he knew that the personal freedom and civil liberty really has a wide range of issues to be dealt with it is violence nothing less than violence that comes in when not just activism but activists are also incarcerated and are alleged with false kind of allegations just as such a held on to democratic socialism as ideology but also felt that the right to agitate and right to face this with our conscience only would be able to save the right of adivasis to land water forest and for all of us to fight the battles in that direction 
So that is missing a lot. Interesting the way you're putting it. The ability of a judge to, in a sense, see himself as a citizen first, and then as in effectively as a member of the bench. But Justice Lokur, you know, we are in a much more polarized society than ever before, ideologically in particular. How do judges then ensure that they disseminate justice above all else when in a polarized society the name calling, the labeling takes place? Are notions of personal liberty becoming more and more selective? If, for example, a human rights activist who's been jailed uh, wants a straw sipper, has to take weeks before he gets one, while maybe someone else who's a VIP privileged will, you know, will get bail even when a vacation, uh, when the courts are on vacation. I just wonder how does a judge now, given uh, what's happening around them, society getting more politicized and polarized, remain above the din and actually deliver justice in an equitable manner? How, 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 what do judges need to do to ensure that? Yeah, you see, there are uh, two. Uh, if I may call them mantras, which uh, Justice has, uh, Justice Sachar has mentioned uh, in his uh, autobiography. Number one, he says that it's the Constitution, you know, which is above everything, right? So you go by the Constitution. The second mantra that he has put forth is that judges have to be people oriented. Now. Which means, uh, as I understand it, and I believe this is what he practiced as well, that don't get into technicalities. You know, I mean, the law has got a lot of, uh, you know, technical words, technicalities, procedures, this, that, and the other. Don't get into all that. You have to do what uh, Mehta said, human justice, right? And one of the examples that he gives was uh, a case of uh, divorce by mutual consent. Now, under the law, the husband and wife have to file an application for divorce by mutual consent, wait for six months, and then you know get a divorce. But what he mentions is that, the, uh, and it has to go to the trial court, by the way, to the district judge. Mm -hmm. But he had a case before him in the high court where the husband and wife were not living together for two years. And, you know, they both wanted a divorce by mutual consent. He asked them if they wanted it. And they said, yes, we want a divorce by mutual consent. So one point of view could be that how can the high court, uh, you know, uh, grant a divorce by mutual consent? It has to go to the district judge. Another point of view could be how could the high court, uh, you know, uh, give up the period of six months? But these technicalities did not stand in the way as far as he was concerned, mm. you know, and he said, well, if they want a divorce, they want a divorce and, uh, you know, I can give a divorce. What's wrong with it? So these are, you know, two things which I think are very, very important, which have come out as far as I'm concerned uh, from his uh, autobiography in pursuit of justice. And that's how, you know, by keeping the constitution and by keeping you know, mm -hmm. uh, the people in mind that you can, uh, you know, deliver justice. But look at where we've come now. Now a couple, a, a married couple <laughs> will have to, before they get married, take uh, go to a DM in Uttar Pradesh and convince the DM that this is a marriage being, which is being taken place by total consensus without coercion. I just wonder, uh, yeah. Justice <laughs> Lokur, you know, the, the constitutionality of such ordinances, does that trouble you? That, you know, that, yes. that when governments themselves are bringing in patently unconstitutional ordinances like the so-called love jihad or religious conversion in this case, uh, as the act is called, that, that, that judges in a sense are being called tangled in political battles. Is that part of the problem? Well, that is a part of the problem, you know, but again, if you look at this, uh, uh, you know, uh, ordinance, for example, from a purely legal and a constitutional point of view, there are so many defects in it. You know, one doesn't have, a judge doesn't have to get into the politics. Why is it being done? You know, is it polarizing or is it not polarizing? You don't have to go into all that. Just look at the constitution and see, well, you know, is it uh, constitutionally valid or not? For example, the constitution requires that an ordinance can be passed only if there is a need for immediate action, right? 
now what is the need for immediate action to uh, pass this ordinance when uh, you know the uh, vidhan sabha is not in session nothing absolutely nothing okay that's one we are looking at it people oriented what are the problems that uh, you know a married couple or interfaith uh, you know couple who wants to get married what are the problems that they are going to find you know you go to a magistrate like you said you know move an application even after marriage you know you have to uh, report to uh, somebody saying that well you know i am i'm married mm -hmm. so again if you look at it either from the point of view of the constitution or you look at it from the point of uh, you know the people there's no way that uh, you know this law can be sustained i mean this ordinance can so, be sustained so what you are saying is as, as justice sachar would say that you know the constitution is your ultimate holy book and you stay away from the politics and report and he gives examples of cases where even political comrades of his from the socialist movement uh, found that justice sachar once in court yes. was no was not necessarily a comrade of theirs i want to bring in mukul rodhi and kapil sibal on an important question which is whether the balance of power in a sense between the executive and the judiciary has shifted so sharply in favor of the executive that the judiciary in a sense and its independence to deliver these judgments on issues of personal liberty human rights dignity of the individual are necessarily getting in a way circumscribed or are shrinking uh, you want to take that mukul rodhi you've been a former attorney general not too long ago uh, do you believe that the balance of power has shifted away from the judiciary so firmly to the executive the judiciary almost finds itself hemmed in uh, 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 mr rodhi no i don't agree with that rajdi in fact as you know our constitution provided for separation of powers between the executive the legislature judiciary etc now in that separation of powers it was it has been my considered view that over the last 30 or 40 years the balance has sharply shifted in favor of the judiciary and the judiciary has been entrenching on the field meant for the other two chambers mm -hmm. by by a process of judgments or whatever you may call it and uh, the executive in the past was not capable of kind of defending their turf that's why it shifted let's say to the right right being the judiciary if at all this balance has somewhat shifted back towards the center mm -hmm. so what was an extreme right in one chamber is kind of maybe has shifted back a little but it is not correct to say that the supreme court or the high courts are hemmed in there is no question of hemming in the constitution as you said is the holy grail and that must govern our uh, relations amongst people vis a vis the government people vis a vis the executive etc etc so, so do you think it's so, only a do you think it's only a perception then mr rothki that the judiciary is not fully independent i i think it i think it's only a perception as mr sibal said whether ca or kashmir if those two cases had been decided in 6 months then the balance would have remained where it is you know some aberrations always occur and ultimately you must also remember that justice is dispensed by an individual or a group of individuals called judges it is not dispensed with by a machine it's not mm -hmm. that you put in a problem and comes out the answer so so sometimes perceptions vary what should be taken up first what should not be taken up first history then judges you whether you were right in taking it up or not taking it up etc etc but just a comment on what justice lokur said yes see about the ordinance in up yes now i personally believe that these forced marriages conversions but taking place galore for whatever reason now if a law is brought and mind you it is the will of the assembly or parliament which is supreme they have to decide they have to decide what the populace requires in form of governance and law at a particular time so it is their will it is not the court's desire whether a law should be brought or should not be brought the only thing which the court will decide is whether the law is according to the constitution or not mm -hmm. if it is an abuse or it is 
a law which parliament could not have framed or if it is hit by any of the constitutional guarantees of equality liberty etc etc then the court will strike it down the court must be dispassionate in mm -hmm. looking at the law vis a vis the constitution that's what it has to decide not whether the love jihad is there not there whether it is pernicious not pernicious so the judges have to kind of keep themselves aloof from mm -hmm. the the milieu and what is going on in the milieu that's right. the way you look at very interesting again uh, uh, the points you are making uh, mr rutiki contentious if i may say so and that's what makes you always stand out you always like to sort of uh, say it like you see it uh, mr sibal you want to respond to that a mr rodhi seems to suggest that the independence of judiciary this concern is the judiciary independent is the perception is not necessarily true if anything he claims the judiciary has expanded its ambit in in recent times you want to respond to that first and then maybe we'll also okay. look at whether judges by their very nature must remain outside the political uh, noise that takes place uh, uh, on all sides without doubt without doubt it it is nothing to do with the political thicket and uh, there's no doubt about that i have three three points to make here number one rajdeep and uh, mr justice lokur will and mukul will agree with me when you talk about the chapter of fundamental rights you will notice that the they talk only about citizens of the country right no citizen shall be all citizens should have the your article 19 fundamental rights deals with citizens throughout that chapter the word that is mentioned is citizen now the question that we need to ask ourselves is then when the when the judiciary look, looks at these laws we then look at these laws in the context of the citizens of this country or do they start looking at these laws in the context of which religion they belong to which caste they belong to and i'm afraid that the uh, that the supreme court unfortunately has in the process of looking at this chapter forgot has forgotten that is they are dealing with citizens of this country which has no relationship to caste to creed to religion to language nobody in this country must be dealt with by the court except in its cases his or her capacity as a citizen that's one problem that i i notice in in recent uh, recently in supreme court number 2 is something that justice sachcha mentions in his book he talks about the master of the roster and he comments on it and he says look this is one of the real problems that judiciary faces it's something that i have been raising for last several years part of the problem is the master of the roster because the master of the roster determines rajdeep as you mention whether the matter will be heard during vacation or a matter that needs urgent hearing will not be heard there is no system in the court which determines when how a particular matter is going to be heard it's all left to the registry which takes directions from the chief justice of the high courts or of the supreme court of india and i think that's that's a flaw that needs to be corrected and the third the, the third issue that i need that i wish to raise is the fact that ultimately justice is delivered by human beings mm -hmm. and human beings and judges must be made of sterner stuff so let's not talk about pressures of the executive over the judiciary let's talk about those who are charged with the responsibility to do justice in accordance with the constitution if those men sitting in those chairs do not do it don't blame the executive blame those who are sitting there they must be of sterner staff because they have taken an oath to the constitution so if the love jihad law is bad it must be dealt with rightly immediately and if ca is bad good or bad it must be dealt with if detentions are good or bad they must be dealt with don't blame the executive blame those who are sitting there who are not dealing with these matters and ask them why no, i'm so asking you no i'm uh, as someone who appears before them i'm asking you why why I do you am, think I, you i am nobody to think it's answer. happening why do you think that today three of uh, very distinguished people from the bar and bench are lamenting 
the, the fact that uh, the judiciary, according to the three of you, is not defending personal freedoms and liberties in the manner that they should. Why is it happening? Remember, it, it happened during, uh, during the ADM Jabalpur judgment as well. That's right, which uh, Justice Sachar judges, talks about in, in the great judges detail. Didn't rise, the judges didn't rise right to the occasion. That was one, in, one, one great judicial disaster that took place. And you have several disasters now that are taking place before our eyes. No, but is it individual or is it institutional? Is what I, is there an individual problem with the people, with the individuals, or is there an institutional flaw? Can't be an inst I can't be an institutional problem because some judges in the Supreme Court uh, are, are passionately dealing with uh, with issues of liberty, but there are many who are not. So the question is, it's ultimately depending on the man who is sitting there deciding a matter, and if he doesn't, if he is not made of sterner stuff, you'll get the kind of judgments that you have. Unfortunately, you know, you know Medha Patkar, you are listening to these three distinguished uh, 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 gentlemen from the bar and bench as a as a human rights yeah, advocate. Madan do you Loku. believe? Yeah, Justice yeah. Madan Lokur, who was dealing with social social justice issues on a daily basis, right? Because he, he the Constitution runs in his blood. That's what he was doing. Right. We don't have men like him anymore. You know, uh, uh, Medha Patkar, as a, as, as a citizen and a human rights practitioner, do you believe in, in some way that, the, that, that human rights activists today are in a way targeted, demonized, to the point where even if they approach the court for uh, justice or basic rights, as we've seen in the case of uh, Father Stan Swami, for example, they get denied those. Do you feel that those in privilege in a way get their personal liberties and freedoms addressed far faster than those today uh, who are seen to be in some way advocates of human rights, described some call you, you know, you also, I think, Medha called an urban Maoist today or part of the Tukde Tukde gang. I wonder whether Justice Sachar would also have been called uh, part of the Tukde Tukde gang for his Sachar report at times. But do you get a sense that you are, you are being isolated, targeted, vilified? Yes, very much so. <laughs> Because uh, I think the inequity and injustice at large that is faced by people is the factor which is influencing the judiciary in the other way around. It is not just the political interference, but it is ease of doing business as the policy in the economic uh, fora that is also influencing the judiciary. And when we see that the chief justices get the political position immediately after retirement. What to talk about it, what to say. We cannot expect much from such justices. But it is also clear that when they deal with the human rights issues and human rights activists' rights, mm -hmm. then they really discriminate between the human rights activists and the corporate rights activists. And we see this not only in the case of Father Stan Sami, who is 83 years old, Banavara Rao, Sudha Bharadwaj, Gautam Navlakha, and also a successor from the Baba Sai Bambedkar's family. We can't really compare all this because they are not even granting bail. Even the jail, uh, the, uh, the concessions and uh, uh, what do you call it, amenities, are not granted to them. The conditions are not improved. And even the state governments are under pressures. So mm -hmm. these all black laws, as we call those, are really pushing the corporate's vision through the judiciary. And that is what we all object to. And hence, when we really question these guys who really are earning per day 384 crores or 1,085 crores. And this is what Justice Sacher would always talk to us about. And that's why he was a staunch democratic socialist fighting inequity and fighting injustice. What can we expect from the judiciary if they have the clear dictates from these kinds of powers who are really ruling this country today? We therefore yes. feel that we cannot only approach the courts. We have mm -hmm. to have a combination of legal and mass battles in every way. And these are not just aberrations. They refuse to deal with per incurium kind of application. They refuse to say not before me. 
they refused to really interpret properly even the 2013 act on the compensation and rehabilitation and land acquisition and they do not even take the external evidence into consideration to the extent that justice p n bhagwati p b gajendra gadkar or justice v r krishna mm-hmm. iyer to do so this is the change in the judiciary and today with the online they have another tool in their hand mute and unmute we have experience <laughs> in the case related to migrant laborers they Let- are farmers who do mm-hmm. not get the msp who do not get the due value for their labor their sweat and blood and that's why they have to walk the distance is worth 1700 kilometers what is the judiciary doing to change this situation basically transform it which can be not just reformative but revolutionary we expect let, a lot from judiciary let me ask that to judge uh, justice lokur is, is is the problem about individuals perhaps or is this an institutional problem at the moment that justice genuinely is getting delayed in serious cases of human rights violations and where individual liberties are at stake where a sudha bhardwaj for example for months and indeed years on end uh, has still not got bail i want i'm referring to her case but it could be true of many others uh, you know surely bail is a right uh, as has often been said by the judiciary itself uh, do you believe that this is an institutional problem an individual problem uh, why you know where and 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 how do we reform it okay <clears throat> you know uh, it's a mixture of both uh, institutional as well as individual uh, let me give you one example from uh, justice sector's uh, autobiography he talks about the 1984 riots right which took place uh, in delhi yes he was dealing with that case and it got uh, spilled over to january the next year and what did the chief justice do the chief justice assigned criminal cases to justice sachar you know took him out of the roster and whatever order justice sachar was going to pass eventually got frustrated because he was not no longer handling that case all right now the chief justice in a situation like this represents the institution he doesn't represent himself individually we've had this problem with the supreme court you know where the uh, master of the roster like uh, kapil said the master of the roster is in charge and if the master of the roster you know decides to shift cases from here to there you know uh, give precedence to some cases not give precedence to other cases it becomes an institutional problem okay so you have an institutional problem you also have an individual problem as mukul said you know some judges may say all right you know uh, i i don't think there's any urgency in uh, you know these uh, habeas corpus cases for example you know mm-hmm. why because these people are terrorists or whatever mm-hmm. now then it becomes an individual issue you know do i hear a particular kind of case i don't want to hear a particular kind of case i think i'll push it off for about two or three months because i'm not interested in that i'm interested in something else some other judge may have a different point of view so it's both you know institutional as well as individual now kapil is right when he says that the person has to be if it's an individual problem the judge has to be made of sterner stuff and this is what distinguished justice sachar from others he was he knew a lot of politicians mm-hmm. right at one point of time he writes in his autobiography that he wanted to resign and uh, stand for elections yes so he was you know into politics uh, you know as we would say but he did not make politics rule his judgment mm-hmm. why because he was made of that sterner stuff that is what is important and unless judges today or at any point of time by today at any point of time unless they are not made of sterner stuff you're going to get judgments like adm jabalpur you're going to get judgments you know where all right you know there's no hurry in uh, deciding a certain category of cases but you know we don't mind sitting uh, you know in the vacation to hear a certain category of cases that's where it becomes an individual problem also so- so you think if justice sachar was around for example habeas corpus petitions on jammu and kashmir or indeed 
the cases in the Delhi riots case where a number of the detainees have uh, been uh, have been in jail without bail for months on end, he would have stepped in. Would oh, that sir. be part of his ideological political convictions or based again on the principles of law and the constitution, uh, Justice Loku? On the principles of yeah, on the principles of the constitution. Hmm. You know, uh, it, it, it's so simple, uh, Rajdeep. You know, you can't keep a person indefinitely in custody, preventive custody without a trial. Hmm. Right? And Justice Sacha would have definitely fought for it. How, how can you, you know, and not, I, I'm not only talking about uh, individual adults. Mm -hmm. Children have been preventively detained. Okay, so I have no doubt that Justice Sacha would have stood up for them. I have no doubt about that. You know, in, in a way, Mukul Rodki, is it about access to justice as well? That, you know, maybe a, a tribal rights activist, a human rights activist, a Dalit activist does not have the same access to justice. Or dare I say the migrants who had to walk home hundreds of kilometers does not have a, the access to justice that those in major corporates may have or with, with political connection may have. We are an unequal society and the judiciary, in a sense, re reflects perhaps that inequality, doesn't it, Mukul Rodki? See, uh, Raideep, there are a host of issues which you and Justice Lokur and Mr. Sibbal has mentioned. First of all, mm -hmm. I agree with Kapil that this master of the roster and absolute unbridled power to direct which cases will be heard first, which will be heard later, and how benches will hear cases, etc., is, is definitely a problem. It has to be streamlined. Some rules have to be made. And we had a huge problem on this account, not now, but about two years ago, two or three chief justices back. And Justice Lokur was very much at the helm of affairs at that time. So that, that's one issue. Mm -hmm. The second issue is, as I said, Rajdeep, don't forget that the court is swamped by the number of appeals which come to it. There are a variety of reasons. The court itself has opened the doors much wider than what the constitution desired. So it's become a super appellate court. Everything from the high court must go to the Supreme Court. That is not the role of the court. If you have 30 judges where the population is 1 billion plus and mm. you are an apex court over every high court and mind you over every tribunal, which mm. was also not the concept of the constitution to have so many tribunals and a direct appeal to the Supreme Court. So you have a country of that size and litigation galore with more than 50% litigation of government, state government, banks, PSUs. If that kind of stuff comes to you on your on your head, how can you carry on carry that burden? The system is collapsing. Some say it is collapsed, some say it is collapsing. And to some extent, lawyers like Simple and I are to blame. I was, waiting, have big I was waiting for cases. you to say that. I was waiting yeah, for I am saying say so. I am saying so. There's the kind of cases which come to us. We are also kind of overawed at times with the with the numbers and figures which are involved. If we go running to the Chief Justice, who is the master, and say, please hear it tomorrow, this will happen, that will happen, 10,000 crores will go down the drain, 5,000 jobs will go, 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 go down the drain, this will happen, it's been nationalized. So, so you know, everybody is human and that's why these cases also at times get take get priority. So there are, you know, it's it's, it's very difficult to say in five minutes. There are a host of problems. Justice Lokur said, judges have to be made of sterner stuff. From where do you get judges? You get, you get them essentially from lawyers, right? So mm. today, an average lawyer is not willing to become a judge. I'm not talking about a good lawyer. I'm saying an average lawyer is not willing to become a judge. Why? Because the, the remuneration which you get, even to an average lawyer, even compared to an average lawyer is one-fifth and compared to a good lawyer is one-twentieth. He doesn't want to become a judge. He says, I have young children. Who going to get them married? How will they get educated? So those old notions are gone. Mind you, the judge's salary in 1950 was about 4,000 rupees mm. at that time. And my father became a judge in 72. It was 3,500. And we didn't get a driver. We had our own car. We used to get 100 liters of petrol. But people survived. Now that has become, say, a lakh and a half or two. What is the value of 4,070 years ago? So people don't want to become judges. If you don't want to become judges and you're going to get maybe third-rate lawyers or 
below average lawyers getting judges and then going up to higher position how are you going to get sterner stuff so it's a host of problems if you increase the salary of judges then the bureaucrats say our salary must be increased the cabinet secretary <laughs> will say my salary will be increased the minister will say so the army will say so i mean you know it's it's a it's a hornet's nest when you open it up there are so many kinds of uh, things coming out of it so it's very very difficult to i mean you talked about stan swami you talked about xy now there may be aberrations i also talked to you also talked about the the journalist who got bail in the vacation now people have two views about it my personal view is it was rightly heard in the vacations no i am no i agree with you i am saying yeah, then yeah. should that no i am i am telling you every, should that yeah, operate because, for every citizen yeah because i had i had a interview with karan thapar yesterday i would like you to see it he raised the same question i said it was good that the court heard it because freedom of speech is one of our most cherished freedoms that no. bail was equal to maybe 1000 regular bails okay. so now 1000 bails cannot be heard in the vacations so somewhere or the other there is prioritization and when you look at in hindsight you could always say this is wrong that is wrong but if you want a full holistic debate i can tell you that there are 100 problems some created by the executive some created by the babu who makes the law some created by judges let me tell you as justice lokur said one judge said i want to hear don't want to hear 30 years ago we had judges i tell you we had a judge if you were for a landlord you could never win the case while in the next court if you were a tenant you could never win the case those were the ideologies with those judges so we have had that is an individualistic uh, streak also but as far as justice sachar is concerned i have appeared before him along with sibal and justice lokor innumerable times he was definitely a socialist he was a man of the people he was never bothered about technicalities and his heart would go out to the poor the down trodden the mm-hmm. migrant or the labor or whatever so we you need people of sterner stuff no doubt about it but difficult to get and get by you know rajdeep, i, I, I want to just intervene rajdeep uh, just yes. to tell you that we've got about 20 minutes left yeah we we will start questions in a couple of minutes but i just want to get uh, and we've got lots of questions uh, let me just bring in uh, 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 mr sibal you know very impassioned uh, enunciation of the deeper crisis that uh, confronts the judiciary there by mr rothgi uh give me a solution <laughs> you know solutions very difficult to find solutions in these days um you know i just want to comment on what uh, justice lokur mentioned about the chief justice of in uh, chief justice of a court um being an institutional problem um well it's it's institutional because he happens to be, be the chief justice of that court to that extent it is institutional but it's an individual problem because not every chief justice would do uh what 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 some chief justices do not every chief justice would actually pick and choose in the bench that the matter would go to so that so where the chief justice doesn't do it it's not an institutional problem so i think it's institutional because he happens to be the chief justice but right. it's an individual problem and i've always maintained that and 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 it's all very well to say look the issues are very complex of course issues are very complex why do you have judges to deal with complex issues if issues were simple there'd be no problem at all it's because no, the issue- point that uh, mr rothgi is making the sheer number of cases so the much, fact that you so can much, go so to a appeal so from much. tribunal to the to the I mean, high, apex court almost instantly the sheer have- burden of cases that is therefore put on the judiciary I limited have- number of judges since i have salaries, been, since i have been, since i have been in this court for the last 45 years right the numbers were always more then the numbers not the number of cases were always much more than the number of judges dealing with them mm-hmm. the situation is always that bad but what does the chief justice do you know chief justice in the supreme court have done in sitting as in the in judgment of their own case has it ever happened in the history of this court in their own case sitting mm-hmm. in court and and chidambaram not getting a date for a hearing you 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 it's fine for somebody else to get a, get a date during the vacation judge but there are many people another journalist in the hathras matter is not you know it said you go back to the you go back to the trial court you go back to the high court mm. whereas somebody else got a hearing during vacation issue is not that issue is the man sitting there 
and and this is no argument to say that you know third rate lawyers become judges the judges of the supreme court were not third rate lawyers the very bright people some of them are have become judges in the supreme court some of them are exceptionally good lawyers but question is what have they done sitting there you and and the assumption is that a man who doesn't have a large practice cannot be a good judge i don't agree with him at all in fact okay. men who have moderate practices can be fabulous judges and we've seen them in the delhi high court even today sitting there they're excellent I, sitting there who didn't have really large practices so i don't think i think ultimately it's your attitude towards the constitution it is your attitude towards the people of india it is your attitude to both the values that you must uphold right and justice suchar had that attitude you know unfortunately for him um, i think he he would have been a far greater force outside of of court because uh, twice he wanted to become a member of the rajya sabha somehow it never came through the third time third time uh, george should judges was, become should judges become politicians uh, mr no, simba no, no. you see his heart was in politics his yes. heart was with with social equity with justice that's where his heart was and he was persuaded by his father to say no 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 you can do the same thing sitting in court that's that's yes. what that's what's all in the autobiography the point yeah, i know that, but i'm i'm asking you whether a retired you judge should become heart, a politician if you have your heart in the right place you'll never go wrong that's the problem with the indian judiciary right okay let me let me that's a good point in which to take the few or uh, several question but i'll just take a few i just as lokur why don't you take this it's an interesting one is this an era where judges need to be judged taking off from what mr sipper said should judges be judged in some way are they being judged enough or not justice lokur quality of judgments manner in which judgments are delivered should they be judged and scrutinized more carefully yes i think uh, it is necessary uh, you know there, there are several reasons for it one is uh, you would have uh, probably read a couple of days ago uh, that the supreme court commented about one particular high court that listen you can't uh, you know just pass an order and in, and uh, deliver judgment much later right uh, i've had that occasion uh, you know twice uh, to say about the same high court and in one case they had ordered demolition of a building right and they said reasons will follow the reasons didn't come and uh, a, a petition was filed in the supreme court what do we do i mean we we have no option but to stay it long time back uh, in the case of uh, jagdev singh talwandi the supreme court said that listen if you are passing an order you have to give reasons the high court at that time had released uh, jagdev singh talwandi from uh, whatever the preventive detention law was applied mm -hmm. and the then attorney general came to the supreme court and said listen i don't know why the high court has released him so the uh, five judge bench of the supreme court said you have to give reasons okay so that's one one aspect of uh, accountability second aspect of accountability would be the length of judgments you know i mean <laughs> you have judgments uh, of 800 pages 900 pages who's going to read all that mm. you know so i think there's a lot of uh, there, there are a lot of issues mukul has raised some of them there are a lot of issues on which introspection is required and i think it's time for the supreme court to actually sit down or the judges to sit down and say that listen let's think about what's happening and what we can do to improve the situation but do they really want to very quickly do they yeah. really want to judge lokur or are they vested interest in actually allowing the system to to continue the way it is i don't know i don't know i i'll <laughs> i'll, I'll, I'll uh, narrate to you one incident yes yes you know, uh, one chief justice uh, had said that uh, you know this was in the month of uh, april right so may and june the court was closed in july around 20 3rd 24th of july i asked the chief justice i was uh, on the bench with him i asked him i said that uh, you know chief justice you said that every month we are going to have uh, a full court meeting we are coming to the end of july i when is the full court meeting due because and these are the words he used he said i am getting bad vibes right <laughs> so 
I don't know. I can't ask that question. <laughs> interesting. I'm getting bad vibes. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Rothke, you've given a very impassioned uh, reasoning of what's wrong with the judiciary. You have a solution. Someone is asking a question saying that, you know, we've heard of the time taking for concluded cases so long it leads to a large number of pendencies. Successive governments talk about it. Nothing ever is done. Will anything ever change? Do you think anything ever will change, uh, Mr. Rodgi, for all the fire you're showing today? You're the angry middle-aged man today. <laughs> Let me tell you, Rajdeep, I wish it changes, but I'm not very sanguine about it. And let me tell you, the change cannot come only from the court. The change must come from every quarter. It must come from the government. It must come from the law ministry. You have to change archaic laws. You have to remove the number of appeals. You have to have a thorough look at that. There has to be accountability in the High Court and the Supreme Court. The High Court, <coughs> you see, uh, scrutinizes the work of district judges. But there's nobody to scrutinize the work of the High Court because the Supreme Court doesn't have appellate power in that sense. So what Justice uh, Lokur said, he said 800 pages. What about 800 pages judgment being delivered by the Supreme Court? Who's going to read that? Now you said, don't give reasons. I mean, if high courts take eight months sometimes or one, 10 months to deliver judgment, same thing happens in the Supreme Court. So what must apply to the goose must apply to the gander. So there has to be, there has to be institutionalized, you know, this is accountability and transparency. You must, mm -hmm. it's not difficult. There are 1,000 judges of the high courts in the country and 30 judges of the Supreme Court. Why can't some somebody uh, judge the work of a judge? How many judgments has he delivered? I mean, there are judges and judges in the high court. There are judges who delivered 500 or 300 judgments in a year when there are judges who delivered 10 judgments in a year. So what happens? Mm -hmm. You blame a bureaucrat because he's got, uh, he's got, uh, uh, you know, uh, if a stable tenure, nobody can remove him except an archaic procedure of an inquiry. Much worse, nobody can remove a judge except by impeachment. Impeachment hasn't happened in the last 50 years. So if you become a judge and you mm -hmm. don't want to pull the weight of, of what your oath is and you deliver 10 judgments in a year, nobody can say anything except that you can be transferred from Madhya Pradesh to Chhattisgarh, Chhattisgarh to Calcutta. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't make a difference because the judge is the judge. Whether very, wherever he goes, he'll have the same traits. If he's not going to work in Delhi, he won't work in Guwahati also. Or X or Y or whatever. So, so there are a host of institutional, constitutional changes which are required. Why do you have a debate when a judge becomes a judge in the US Supreme Court? You have a debate, nationalized TV. Somebody going to ask the judge, did you smoke a joint when you were 17 years of age? Because there's something said in your college when you were undergraduate. The judge has to answer. So, you know, there are a host of things. Collegium system, we've had so much talk on the collegium. Collegium system was upheld in that judgment. But half the judges today, even today, will tell you privately or otherwise that the system is no good. Who yeah. knows who is being appointed and why? No reasons are recorded. Can I? Because, I mean, it's, so well, there are a host of problems. We, and a we need to get you. We need to get you in a round table soon, uh, 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 Mr. Rodgi, uh, on an extended forum. And we will do that soon. But I just want to give one final word to both uh, Medha Patkar and uh, Kapil Sibal. Uh, Mr. Sibal, you, uh, you ducked that question I asked you because as you said, Justice Sachar in the book said he wanted to join. He's very candid. And you know that's one thing that comes out in the book. He's extremely candid. He said he wanted to join politics. I'm asking you, should judges join politics, Mr. Sibal? Not after they have served the court. Okay. Not, Not after, after they've served the court. I mean, they, they should join. I mean, potential... Should, they, uh, should there be a period no. of two years and three years after which they can join? Or uh, do you believe that the no, cooling off period? Or judges, never I at all? Join. I don't think judges should join. I mean, look at what such, uh, uh, Justice Sachar said. Once he was offered the Padma Award, he refused it. He said, look, you know, I did my duty. That's about it. I don't want to be part of politics at all. Don't want this to be a dispensation by the government to me. See, mm -hmm. Rajdeep, let's cut it all short. There is a crisis of integrity. There is a crisis of integrity in the political system. There's a crisis of integrity in the judicial system. And, you know, these are, these are very difficult times. And, and okay. un unless we, and remember, you can criticize parliament, you can criticize the executive, it's all open. You can't criticize the judiciary, which is why lots that's happening within the system never comes out. 
So we don't know how bad the situation is, but there is a deep Let crisis of integrity. Just a minute left, uh, Medha Patkar, if you today want to pay a final tribute to uh, Justice Sachar, what would you say? What is it? What is the biggest lesson you think that today's judges could learn from your experiences with Justice Sachar, especially as part of citizens' movements? Justice Sachar really delivered a lot to this society, not only to the clientele or the, uh, you know, the petitioners as a judge. And mm -hmm. he was always for not necessarily judging the judges, but judging the judgments. Right. And he always wrote on every national and international issue, watching, yeah, categorically yeah. and courageously. That courage and commitment is lacking in many judges, although they are, there are exceptions, no doubt. As the chairman of the Commission on Minorities, his contribution is a historic one. As the chairman of the president of PUCL, he fought every battle, not only right to food, but also right to nonviolent agitations. And that's why against encounters fake, against fake allegations, mm -hmm. against the movements, everything mattered today. When the farmers are sitting on the borders of Delhi and are demanding justice, not before the Supreme Court, they never went to the Supreme Court. Suomoto implement is something mm -hmm. which is wrong, but the judicial reforms and judicial accountability, both the issues which are brought through this panel, I'm really thankful that this at least is accepted, but we have no access to judges and who have access to judges, we know very well. Okay. We have access to justice and that's what was the what? of the issue taken up by Justice Sacha. And what that's we why need uh, very well put. What, what we what we need is access to justice, not so much yes. access to judges. Yes. But yes. I, you know, I, I had a very controversial question, and I wanted yes or no answer as we end from you, uh, Justice Lokur. There have been serious allegations of corruption and moral turpitude against certain recent CJIs of the Supreme Court. Does this make them vulnerable to pressure from the government? You want to give me a yes or no answer to that, Justice Lokur? Uh, I will say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> All of you have been so candid and then at the end you say no comment to us. But either way, I think it's been a privilege because I think all of you knew Justice Sachar in various ways. And I think his life has spanned several uh, generations and has touched very many lives. And I'm so glad that he's brought out this book because as I said, the candor in a sense reflects the man as someone who had nothing to hide. And that to my mind is what really makes him a man of sterner stuff or true steel, as uh, Justice Lokur suggested. We need perhaps more men and women of steel in the times in which we live. Thank you all very much for joining us. I want to hand it back to Rini. Uh, and it's been a privilege once again. So thank you to the Sachar family for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the esteemed guests on the panel, Honorable Justice Lokur, Kapil Sibal, Medha Patkarji, and uh, Mukul Rohatki for that really engaging and riveting discussion uh, on personal freedom and judiciary. Uh, thank you, Rajdeep, for steering that discussion so uh, beautifully that you do, uh, yeah. as usual. Uh, on behalf of the Indian Law Institute and the Indian Society of International Law, I'd like to now request the Secretary General of ISIL, Mr. N. Koteshwara Rao, to please say a few words. Uh, thank you very much. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Sanjeev Sachar, an Honorable Judge, uh, Supreme Court, uh, previous Supreme Court, and now Supreme Court of Fiji, uh, Justice Madan Lokur, Former Minister Kapil Sibalji, Former Attorney General Mukul Rohatpiji, uh, Madam Rini Khanna, and the members of family of uh, the Raji, Rajendra Sachar, Professor, uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha of the Indian Law Institute. It's a great privilege to address you, address this gathering on the occasion of uh, the birthday of. Uh, late Justice Rajendra Sachar and this day on behalf of Indian Society of International Law and the Indian Law Institute. Uh, I have a couple of points to make. 
I was given five minutes time. I hope to be confined to five minutes. From the, uh, I had to some information. I had to first of all, I had to share some information. Indian Society of International Governing Council in February 19, 2019 uh, decided to host uh, memorial lectures of uh, Justice Rajan Sita. We held such a first memorial lecture, Rajan Sita memorial lecture, on last year, Human Rights Day, 10th December, and Judge Madan Lokur was our, uh, he delivered the first memorial lecture. It was on human rights concerns and challenges. The secondly, as you know, Indian Society of International Law runs five postgraduate diploma courses on international law, trade, business law, intellectual property rights, human rights, humanitarian law, environmental law. So we have instituted at the request of for the family of uh, Justice Sachar's family, and of course, we unanimously decided, the executive body of the Indian Society of International Law decided to institute an award for the student who gets the highest marks in human rights. So last year, we awarded the student, and this year also, we are going to hold a uh, uh, function, and we are going to award the student who got the highest marks. So this information I want to share. And of course, uh, the during the discussion, uh, the panelists have spoken about the uh, ADM Jabalpur case, and uh, this is Rajan Sitar mentioned in the book, and also about the roster. I don't get into that thing, maybe somewhat controversial. There are a couple of issues which he mentioned from page 2010 to 2013 in the page. One is about the, the passing of former chief justice Sabhisaj Mukherjee in London uh, in 1990, September. And also, Justice Rajan Sachar was <laughs> elected to the, the Human Rights Commission Subcommission for the protection of, uh, for the prevention of discrimination and protection of minority rights, protection of minorities. So on these couple of things, uh, the he briefly mentioned in one paragraph about the death of the Justice Rajan Sita, Justice uh, Sabesha Mukherjee in London. There were allegations about uh, when the dead body was there, when the uh, the Sabesha Mukherjee's dead body was there in the hospital. There was a party was going on in the London High Commission. High Com that time, Mr. Kuldeep Nair was the High Commissioner in London, and it so happened, uh, Mr. Kul uh, Kushwan Singh was also there. Uh, there were allegations and also it was raised in the parliament but what it did minister of external affairs it constituted a committee one man committee of justice chennapuri but it was not under the inquiry commission act commissions of inquiry act it's not a statutory body but it's a one man commission by administrative order i happened to be the liaison officer to justice chennapuri and he came of course he interviewed Mr. Kuldeep Nair, Kushwan Singh, and uh, present Attorney General, Mr. K.K. Venugopal, and government officials, and a few other lawyers also, who agitated, <coughs> and also a few politicians. And he gave his uh, report, two volume report, uh, which of course, I am not, uh, I don't know anything what happened to that one. That report was submitted to the straight away in a sealed cover, he asked me to give it to the minister's office. I gave it and nothing happened. So this I want to share with you. The second thing about the, his election to the subcommission for the protection of minorities, <laughs> there are one issue which he, there are four or five issues he mentioned as a cover. One I want to mention, when he was there as a member of commission, he was one of the four members selected from the Asian group. Uh, he got highest votes in the election, in the General Assembly. Uh, where the, during that time, Benazir Bhutto government was dismissed. And he wanted to raise that issue as a human rights issue. But the subcommission is meant for protection of minorities. And it seems the government of India told him, uh, this is not a, a political issue, perhaps it may not be raised. 
the way in which I read it. Uh, but it seems he says, but he will, uh, he considers, Justice Rajan Sitar considered the government. I am not here to do the bidding of the government of the day. I was elected, okay, but uh, I am I'm independent. Uh, I don't know, but that's uh, he has his own views. Uh, but uh, the point is, dismissal of a government in what way is concerned of the, the protection of minorities. That one issue, I leave it at this. The most important thing he mentioned about, he praised all the, the Canadian government. The tribals, Indian tribals, the land were taken by the, uh, the government and they converted into a big golf course. Uh, that, of course, an injustice. And there were firings when the agitated tribals, agitated, indigenous people agitated, there were firings. And committee rightfully put the put into account and called for the information from the Canadian government. And Canadian government shared the information and we appreciated it. The another issue about the Iraq government. Iraq government, of course, the politics have come into picture. When Iraq invaded Kuwait, the sanctions were imposed by the security councils. And sanctions were being implemented mostly by the United States of America and the big powers. They were demanded Iraq government to release all the foreigners. But Justice Sachar and others, they said, look, yes, they should demand, they should release it. But at the same time, you are blocking the essential medicines and essential commodities to them. They should also be part of the resolution. But there was no consensus. How the big powers played, on one hand, they want what they want, but they don't want at the same time give any concession. So this, I think, the credit should go to people like Rajan Sachar in the committee. At the end of it, resolution was not passed, but the statement was made. In the statement, they mentioned both, yes, Iraq should, Iraq should release all the foreigners immediately. And at the same time, the essential supplies of medicines and goods should not be stopped. They should be exported to Iraq. Another most important milestone in the in that group in 1993 95 uh, he said uh, he gave a report on the right to adequate housing and it was accepted by committee subsequently he was made to be a special reporter as a special reporter he gave a report and that report has become a basis for the adoption of a year resolution that is actually tribute to Justice Rajan Sitar at the United Nations level. And we must uh, recognize that one. The second thing, it was also published as a United Nations document by the Habitat, UN Habitat. That's most important. So these are the issues which I want to share. And from Indian society point of view, we are always there and we are going to hold one more uh, the memorial going to hopefully because of pandemic, we could not hold it. But definitely now that online, we will consider to hold the second memorial lecture, which is due. And I thank you very much. Thank all the members. And thank you, Madam Vinikala, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Koteshwara Rao. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the close of uh, the event. Um, Ms. Patkar and uh, Mr. Rohatki and Rajdeep have unfortunately had other work to do, so they've left us. Um, we've come to the close, and I'd like to call upon Justice Sacha's son, Sanjeev Sacha, to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, very quickly, let me just tell you that Sanjeev is a chartered accountant by training, and he set up the Egon Zender Practice, the world's largest privately held executive search firm in India in 1995, and led it for about two decades before retiring recently as senior partner. He currently spends the majority of his time in the social uh, sector space, and is on a board is on the board of uh, a couple of corporates. He often talks of the four H principles that his father, Justice Sacha, guided him to follow. So let me invite Sanjeev to tell us more about his special relationship with his father, the late Justice Sacha. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rini. So, you know, father from childhood used to always sort of. Tell me that, look, my son, whatever you do, wherever you are, you know, just keep these four principles in mind in whatever you do, whatever decision you take. And those were honesty, humility, 
hard work and humor and i sort of call it the dad's 4h principles which i sort of follow even till today and and that actually is one of the sort of principles which i sort of share with 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 the youngsters um, who are sort of going to be leading their life and 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 doing various activities so you've heard about dad being a very very simple person uh, his life was totally dedicated to protecting and providing justice and human rights for the vulnerable people of the society he was a man of very very simple taste very simple life and i'm going to share with you a story which his simple style got me into trouble um so if people i don't know how many people would remember but the one the first time we had a major petrol hike in india was in early 70s and you know he said look you know he was a judge we had an official car and he says look the petrol has become too expensive it's going to be too expensive to go in the car to the high court and i'm going to start cycling so i looked at him and i say what do you mean cycling he says yes you know i anyway cycle in the evening so instead of cycling in the evening i'll go to the court on cycle well with you know it was very difficult to argue and so there he was he he went on a cycle and uh, one of his peers was following him he was of course dressed in his churidar kurta and his achkan uh, being followed by his uh, subedar or whatever uh, carrying his files and as expected it was front page news um and i was in school and i was attending the uh, school uh, assembly and suddenly uh, the principal of my school late mr amen kapoor called out my name and he says is sanjeev sachar in the hall i got up he says he says sanjeev how did you come to school today i said sir uh, kapool he says kapool and then he looked at everyone and said look look at this boy he comes in a to school in a car and guess what his father goes to the office in a cycle and obviously i came back and i told dad i said dad you got me into trouble but of course it it had to take a lot of lawyers to convince him that he had to go back to a car and guess what 15 years later he did that again or maybe 10 years later when he was transferred to jaipur and as a punishment he was not given a car he was back on a cycle and he was known actually as the cycle judge till till one of the brother judges very kindly offered him to give him a lift so for him you know this was no no big deal you know yes we did have an official car he felt strongly that you know we couldn't afford it or the the institution couldn't afford it uh, and it came naturally to him um so there are many many stories but which one could share i like to take this opportunity to thank the esteemed panelists for taking our time to join us in what has been a really very very emotional milestone for us as a family uh with each one of you dad had a very very special relationship with meda ji he has gone to the remotest locations dressed in his crisp churidar kurta and achkan and wearing his sneakers fighting for the cause of dalits poor farmers with justice lukur he has had numerous discussions on a common i think subject which they strongly believe which is human rights and guess what most of them were when they were enjoying a swimming enjoying a swim at the delhi jamkhana club uh, which was dad's favorite uh, place uh with with mr sibyl uh the the relationship with the family goes back to the beautiful city of chandigarh when mr sibyl's father and my father were practicing lawyers in the punjab and haryana high court 
and again a very very strong bond in relationship with with mukul the relationship was on politics and judiciary and again with mukul it has really been the long years of relationship my father had with his father justice uh, avad bihari who was also the judge of the delhi high court so there is and and with rajdeep he always admired him for his boldness and frankness with which he conducted the debates which father never missed out on so once again thank you very much to all the panelists you be, you've been very kind to have taken out time to join us i'm going to take this opportunity rini also to thank the publishers led by kapish for uh, taking out the book and more importantly i like to have a special thank you to the executive editor of uh, rupa uh, dibakar ghosh who actually was the first person i shared when father agreed that he would do an autobiography so dibakar thank you very much and again a very very special thank you to chitra padmanabhanam it is thanks to her that we've been able to give a shape to this book uh completely admire her for her hard work and the rigor of research that she's done i like to also thank the co-hosts you know mr manoj sena and mr mk rao for joining us um uh, and 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 before concluding thank you very much to mr soli surab ji for writing the foreword for the book mr surab ji has a special friendship with the family he's been with us been especially when we went through some tough times so thank you very much mr surab ji thank you to kailash ji and javed akhtar ji for the emotional endorsements that they've given and also to late swami agnivesh ji for the endorsement and to meeda ji who also has given an endorsement for the book and finally to the lovely audience who have joined us for this session a big big thank you very much and rini thank you very much for conducting this session thank you thank you sanjeev i know that it's a very particular i mean you know deeply emotional moment for all of you um and thank you for sharing the intimate and personal uh closing note that you gave us today ladies and gentlemen i have to add my personal thanks uh to the entire such a family uh, especially to the grandchildren who uh were so uh, magnanimous with their time and uh, effort to put that uh, video messages across thank you so much but more so to the two dear family members who've uh, been in the in the you know background who've been very quiet and silent these are madhvi uh, just as such as daughter and uh, daughter in law sita both of who have been silent but strongest supporters of the family contributing selflessly uh, to everyone and everything uh, thank you both madhvi and sita for everything that you do so quietly on the sidelines i would also like to draw your attention to the website that has been very beautifully captured um this captures various aspects of justice sachar and the many activities that he pursued be it the articles and speeches that he wrote or gave uh, the reports that he wrote and made or the cases that he argued the website justicesachar.com is a treasure trove of all that he achieved in his lifetime on topics that were close to his heart whether it was human rights religion caste gender judiciary international affairs politics electoral reforms or law constitution uh, and governance so it will be of uh, great significance and academic interest to everyone and i encourage you to find the time to please look it up uh, to everyone who joined today on facebook and on zoom thank you once again thank you to rupa publications uh, for putting up that facebook uh, page and the live uh, event to join uh, a reminder lastly to get yourself a copy of the book uh, the book is now available on amazon flipkart and snapdeal as well as in all leading bookstores thank you very much ladies and gentlemen we take um, leave of you now happy reading and of course season's greetings to all of you